heuristic and a search for solving inference diagrams. The main task in inference diagrams is to compute the maximum expected utility and optimal decision policies, and it is considered one of the most challenging tasks in the graphical model. The annual search with decomposition based heuristic has been proved effective for many probability inference queries such as map inference, summation, and marginal map. In this paper, we first present results of applying annual search for inference diagrams with a heuristic function generated by the weighted mini-bucket bounds. The annual search space for inference diagram is first presented in 2010 without heuristics. And then more recently, the composition bounds for inference diagrams have been developed by extending the techniques in probabilistic graphical models. An inference diagram comprised of chance nodes drawn as circles, decision nodes drawn as squares, and value nodes drawn as diamonds. The chance nodes define conditional property functions like in a Bayesian network. The decision nodes define policy functions that's a mapping between the observed random variables to the decision. These observed random variables are represented by the incoming arcs to the decision node. And lastly, the value nodes define utility function of the variables. In this work, we used valuation algebra, which uses a pair of probability and utility expected utility function for computing the maximum expected utility. This allows smooth integration into the annual search framework for the graphical model. To identify problem structure, we first generate a primal graph by converting the inference diagrams as an unrestricted graph of nodes associated with the variables. And then we introduce an edge if two variables appear in some function together. The sequential decisions constrain the order of computation. In this example, we make decision D0 after observing S0 and S1, and then we make decision D1 after further observing S2 and S3. Implicit assumption in inference diagrams is that the agent never forgets the history and the constraint ordering reflects such property. From a primal graph, we can derive a pseudotree consistent to the constraint ordering. In this figure, the top-down order is consistent to search ordering that can be instantiated as an end of search space. And the bottom-up order is consistent to the inference that also instantiate exact variable elimination scheme or approximation schemes such as weighted mini bucket bounds that's providing the upper bound or admissible heuristics. The contribution of this work is to extend the existing annual heuristic search framework for solving inference diagrams. We implemented branch and bound search with weighted mini bucket based heuristic and tested on system administration and DP domain problems. In the table, we show results from system administration domain with 10 and 15 servers and we unrolled time horizons up to 5 and 10. We can see that the WMB provides a good global upper bound uh, uh, compared to the optimal solution in these test problems. And AOBB search with WMB heuristic improved the search compared to AO or AOBB with MBE. To conclude, we first presented annual search with decomposition based heuristic for solving inference diagrams. And then as a future work, we are developing more efficient search strategies over the annual search graph and developing tighter variational bounds for inference diagrams. Thanks very much.
Hello everyone, I'm Florian Geis and I'm going to present our paper Try-Based Heuristic Tree Search by MDPs with Factor Action Spaces. This is joint work together with David Speck and Thomas Keller. As most of you probably know, Markov decision processes, or in short MDPs, allow us to model probabilistic decision-making problems and they have been successfully applied to different domains such as satellite mission planning, dam management or conversation planning. Common solution techniques for Markov decision processes are either heuristic search approaches, such as the LOSTAR or the AOSTAR algorithm, or trial-based sampling algorithms such as Monte Carlo Tree Search or the UCT algorithm. In this talk we are going to focus on so-called factored MDPs, where we can represent the state and the action space compactly, and the semantics of the MDP are given in terms of state and action variables. And actually all of these different domains here can be represented by factored MDPs. Additionally, we are going to focus on finite horizon MDPs. Formally, a finite horizon MDP consists of a finite set of states. We have some together with some initial state, a finite set of actions. We have a reward function that tells us, given a state and an, a given a state and an action, what is the reward we get if, if we apply this action in the state. We have a state transition function. What is the probability, given an action and a state, of applying this action in a state to get to a successor state? And we have a finite horizon, that means we can only apply a finite number of actions and until we reach a terminal state. A solution to an MDP is a policy, that is a mapping from states to actions, and usually we aim for policies that maximize the expected reward in the initial state. And in this talk we are also going to focus on algorithms that interleave planning for the count state and the execution. As I said, we are interested in factored MDPs and, and, and especially in MDPs with factored action spaces. Here, the set of actions is induced from a set of so-called action variables, which we also say for which we also say base actions. And each base action has a finite domain. And then we have a partial action assignment that takes a base action and assigns to its one of the domain values. And if the partial action assignment assigns a domain value to every base action, then this is a complete action assignment or simply an action of the MDP. Now, let us look at some example MDP here. We have a really small MDP. We only have a single state and a horizon of one. That means we can only apply one action. And we have 20 different actions decomposed into two base actions. We have B0 and B1. The domain of B0 is binary, either it's true or false. And the domain of B1 has 10 different values from 0 to 9. And the reward function of this, of this MDP is such that if we assign B0 a value, a value of false, we have a reward of 10 here on the right side of the tree. <clears throat> and if we assign a value, a B0 a value of 2, we have a reward of 20. Or in other words, an optimal the reward of the action only depends on the assignment of B0 and the assignment of B1 is irrelevant for the reward of the action, but we still have 20 different actions. Now, how can we solve such an MDP? There are many different algorithms and in our paper we focus on algorithms described in the trial-based heuristic tree search framework, or in short THGS a framework to describe many common MDP algorithms and, is a, and it is a generalization of Monte Carlo tree search. Usually, or as usual, we maintain a tree of alternating decision and chance node, nodes. Here the decision nodes correspond to states or choices of actions we can take and the chance nodes correspond to state action pairs or the probabilistic uh, branches or the out branches of probabilistic outcomes. The nodes in this tree keep track of state and state action value estimates so that we can, so the root node uh, always tracks what is the count estimate of the initial state. And this tree is iteratively extended and updated in so-called trials. As I said, THDS is not one algorithm, but it is a framework to design uh, MDP algorithms. And the algorithms are described in terms of so-called components. We have six different components. We have the action selection component, which action do we select? We have the outcome selection component to select the probabilistic outcome. We have an initialization function, a heuristic estimate, which gives us a heuristic estimate for a state or a state action pair. Then the trial length determines how long a trial runs. And after a trial is finished, we have the backup function to backup value estimate, to backup values and update value estimates. And finally, after we have completed all of the trials, or after we have, uh, after we are finished with the count one, we have the action recommendation function which tells us which action we want to finally execute. And 
example algorithms uh, described which can be described in the THTS framework are, for example, UCT, AOSTAR, or more recently, Alpha Zero can also be described within the THTS framework. Now let's get back to our running example again. Here in the following, we show the running example with the UCT, with UCT as the THTS algorithm, where the action selection is based on the UCB1 formula and the backup function is um, based on Monte Carlo backups. Now, if you don't, if you are not familiar with UCT, that is not too important for this example because the only thing we are interested in are the value estimates we get. And here now we see the tree after 20 trials. At this point, each action has been executed once, and this is actually common to many um, many different THJS algorithms that you have to execute each action at least once until you can try out an action for a second time. And since we have 20 actions, we need at least 20 trials. Uh, before we can now try out an, a second, uh, an action a second time. And you can see here the estimate of the root node. The value, we have a value estimation of 15, which is far off from the optimal estimate, which should be 20, because well, we can always just execute one of these actions with a reward of 20. Now, if we would perform additional trials from now on, or well, from now on for the next large number of trials, we will only select an, uh, one of these left actions here, an action where B0 is true. And if we perform the UCT algorithm for additional 1000 trials, the root estimate would, uh, would be 19.9. .9. Now, there's one observation. First, uh, after 1000 trials, we still are a bit off from the optimal value estimate. And after 20 trials, the value estimate is quite off. Uh, the value estimated in the root node is quite off from the optimal value. And the reason for that is that we have to execute all of the suboptimal actions at least once. But the question is now, of course, do we really have to do that? Because we have this pack.action representation. Can we maybe make use of this representation and instead concentrate only on promising assignment of the actions without spending the effort on unfruitful paths? And that was the key question for us. And the answer is, of course, yes, we can. And the key idea here is that we, instead of having a, sing a single decision node, we now replace a single decision node with so-called decision trees. So before we had one root node, one root decision node. Now we have a root decision node tree. Each layer in this decision node tree corresponds to an assignment of a single base action. So if we have n different base action, the root uh, here we would have the decision or the assignment of uh, 2b0, here we have the assignment of b1, and so on. And a really useful property of this um, decision node, of this realization representation with decision node trees is that it requires almost no change to the THTS framework, because we still visit decision, decision nodes, we still visit chance nodes, the only uh, thing that changes now, instead of having this decision or chance node, now we have multiple decision nodes in a row until we visit a chance node. <clears throat> and the only really significant change we have to make is before each decision node only represented a state, but now a decision node represents a state and a partial action assignment. So our initialization function, now we now require an initialization function uh, for states and partial action assignments. And I get back to that later. But for now, let's look at our running example. Before we had this flattened representation where we had one decision node and 20 different uh, successor nodes, and now we have this factor represent, uh, representation where we have this decision node tree. <clears throat> Again, we look at the UCT algorithm, and in this, this time the UCT algorithm is able to select an action where B0 is equal to true after uh, a second time after already 11 trials. So this is a tree after 11 trials. We see here we have already a quite good value estimate of 19.166 after 11 trials. That is the first observation. Yeah, so the first observation is that the root estimate is more informed. And now if we would perform additional trials, we would already have an estimate of 19.9 .9 after 100 trials, whereas before we required 1000 trials to reach this estimate of 19.9. .9. And there's also a second interesting observation. Before, we had to visit each of the suboptimal actions at least once. So we had 10 visits to suboptimal actions. But now, we only have to visit a suboptimal action, action once. And the other suboptimal actions, are, suboptimal actions are not even part of the search tree. 
So you can see here we have our hood decision node, the assignment of B0, we have this assignment of B0 to false and we only have one child here. And the reason for that is, well, we still in the root node, we still have to assign, uh, to try out or to execute each assignment in this case at least once. But since after this assignment here, we already have a value estimation of 10, from now on we will for a long time only, only try out this path, uh, this path of the tree. So, of course, you can see, uh, you may already see that the ordering of the base actions plays an important role because if we now swap the ordering from B0 to B, from B1 to B0, <coughs> we would get a worse performance, but it's, uh, and it depends a bit on the type breaking mechanism you use, but still, in the worst case, we are still not uh, worse than the base, uh, than the flattened representation. That's quite important to know. Okay. So, coming back to the initialization function, usually we have a heuristic uh, estimate for states and for state action pairs, so for a complete action assignment, but now we want a heuristic for partial action assignments. And the question is, of course, can we make use of already existing heuristics? So, given a state action heuristic, can we, make, uh, can we use that to construct a partial action assignment, to a heuristic for a state and a partial action assignment? And the answer was yes, but I don't have too much time here, so for more details, please have a look at the paper. Instead, I want uh, to briefly present the theoretical and empirical results we have. So first, the most important theoretical result is that many of the component instantiations of the THDS framework preserve their behavior, and that includes Monte Carlo backups, Max Monte Carlo backups, partial Batman backups, and full Batman backups, or in other words, Many of, the algorithms, many of the algorithms for that we know that they converge to an optimal policy when the number of trials goes to infinity still guaranteed, guarantee that with defected representation. So we can have the benefits of defected representation and still have our optimality guarantees, which is quite important because usually we are interested in optimal policies or we want at least to approximate optimal policies. For the empirical evaluation, we implemented the factored representation into the post-planning system. We evaluated um, all of the domains of the past three IPPC of the International Probabilistic Planning Competition. In total, that are 280 instances. We have a similar experiment setting as to the IPC, IPPC of 2018, except that the final result is the average accumulated reward of 100 rounds, and we have one second planning time per step. Now, all of the results are of course in the paper, so I only present one, one well, or perhaps the most interesting result here, and that is the IPC score for problems that do allow for concurrent actions. So basically here uh, for each of the different domain, we accumulated the IP, aggregated the IPC score. And you can see here in this table, basically, these three columns here are different factored heuristics, so all of these uh, configurations represent a factored representation, whereas this column here represents a flattened representation, so the original baseline or the original configuration of the post system. And the most important part here is that we can see that we outperform uh, the flattened representation for, um, for problems that are low for concurrent actions. And mostly, or this is due to three domains, chromatic dice, manufacturer, and wildlife preserve, where the, where we can get the most, where we can get the most of, of, out of the factored representation. <clears throat> now, of course, this table here presents only problems that allow for concurrent actions, so these are problems where the factored representation potentially pays off. And, as I said, for more details and more empirical results, Please have a look at the paper. And this already concludes my presentation. The, we have seen that the factored representation allows the, to us to concentrate on promising assignments. We can potentially explore exponentially less actions, which is quite important. And additionally, we preserve the optimality guarantees of well-known algorithms. The base action ordering is important for a good performance. We have some results for that in the paper, but still there is much more work to do. And once again, for more details, please have a look in the paper. Thank you for listening.
Hi, I'm Dor Atzmon, a PhD student at Ben Gurion University. This research is called Multidirectional Search. This is joint work with Zhao Yang Li, Ariel Fellner, Eliran Achmani, Shachaf Sperberg, Nathan Stuttervant, and Sven Koning. In the multi-agent meeting problem, we have a MEP and K agents, each with a start location. The task is to find a meeting location for the agent. On the left side, the agents meet at location V1, and on the right side, the agents meet at location V2. In this research, we consider two cost functions to evaluate the quality of a meeting location with respect to the shortest path from each of the start locations to that meeting location. Sum of costs, which is the sum of the cost of the paths to the meeting location and Makesman, which is the cost of the longest path to the meeting location. In this example, we can see that V1 has lower sum of cost, while V2 has lower Makesman. Multi-agent meeting has, has many real-life applications, such as choosing a gathering point for multiple traveling agents, or suggesting a meeting location that needs to be uh, close to important surrounding locations. To find the optimal meeting location for either sum of cost or make span, we introduce MMSTAR. MMSTAR is a multi-directional heuristic best fair search algorithm. While in classic heuristic search, the heuristic function estimates the cost to the goal location. Here, we cannot estimate this cost as we do not know where is the optimal meeting location. Thus, the heuristic function estimates the cost to the optimal meeting location plus the cost of the other agent to get to that location. We use this heuristic for minimizing either sum of cost or make span, and we suggest three such admissible heuristic functions. I now briefly explain each of these heuristic functions. H1, the click heuristic, uses a classic heuristic such as a straight line heuristic between each two locations to compute a heuristic for, a meet, for the meeting location. H2, the median heuristic, is designed for grids. We compute the median location over both dimensions of the grid. This location is an optimal meeting location for an empty grid, and, and thus is admissible for grids with, optic, with obstacles. H3, the fast map heuristic, embeds the locations of the graph into a L1 space. Then, it applies H2 on the generated embedding. We proved formally that each of these heuristic functions is admissible, and that, given an admissible heuristic, MMSTAR is guaranteed to return the optimal meeting location. We evaluated MMSTAR with our heuristic functions and compared them to a blind search version of MMSTAR. This table shows the average time of each of the different heuristic functions for five agents on 500 by 500 grids with 10% obstacles. Here, H2 was the fastest. We also experimented on a larger grid with many more obstacles called Enigma. Here, H3 was the fastest. We showed that MMSTAR always performs better with heuristics and explained the benefits of each of the suggested heuristic functions. The full paper of this research was accepted to HK 2020. Thanks for listening.
Good day everyone, my name is Sri Ram Gopalakrishnan and I will be presenting the work on FastMapD, which is a way of embedding directed graphs in potential fields. This is a joint work with Leron Cohen, Sven Koenig and Satish Kumar. Before we delve into the details, I'd like to give a quick overview to frame the research work in the right setting and give the motivation. Embedding graphs in Euclidean spaces is useful for many problems in AI. Perhaps the most obvious is for path planning and the multi-agent meeting problem, but it actually applies to many more problems. For example, community detection and social network graphs, representing the knowledge base for question answering systems, and more generally, it can be helpful for any problem where the information can, is represented as a graph. But Euclidean distances are symmetric and directed graphs can have asymmetric distances. So how do we handle the asymmetry? The idea is to learn a potential field function and overlay this on the embedding space as illustrated to account for the asymmetry. To help your intuition, think of the potential field due to gravity. The cost of going uphill is different from the cost of going downhill. So what we do is embed the average distance between two nodes, A to B and B to A, and then account for the difference with the true distance in each direction using the potential field function. To help understand FastMap, we will quickly go over the evolution of the algorithm from its beginnings to its present modification that supports director graphs. The original FastMap algorithm came from the data mining community. In it, each entity was an abstract object, not a node in a graph, and they assumed that pairwise distances are computable in constant time. For example, if the objects were DNA strings, we can compute the distance between any pair of objects in constant time. The algorithm embeds these distances in a Euclidean space of a specified k dimensions and would run in linear time. So how are these embedding coordinates computed? Let's start with the coordinates for the first dimension. We first heuristically select two points, A and B, that are far apart. We call them pivot points. Note that they are heuristically chosen, and they are not necessarily the furthest points. That would take longer order of n-square comparisons, and the original fast map data mining algorithm ran in linear time. The coordinate for A would be zero in this first dimension, and the coordinate for B would be the distance from A to B. These are our pivot points. Then for every other node i, we use the distances to the pivot points to compute a coordinate value xi as a perpendicular projection onto the line between a and b as illustrated. Not all of the distances between nodes is accounted for in this first dimension. This leads us to the recursive step in the algorithm. To understand the recursive step, let's take two points i and j that are not the pivot points. Part of the distance between them is captured in the first dimension, which use the pivot nodes a and b. The remainder is projected onto the hyperplane perpendicular to the first dimension, and this residual distance is computed by the formula shown. Note that the distance between a and b is fully accounted for in the first dimension, and a and b project to the same point in the hyperplane which is what we want. The embedding process previously discussed is repeated with these residual distances. This recursive step is repeated for as many dimensions as desired. This succinctly is the original fast map for abstract objects. Fast map was then adapted for undirected graphs in the following way. The challenge in graphs is that pairwise distances are not computable in constant time. It's a function of graph size, but all is not lost. Since we need the distance between A and I and I and B, where A and B are the pivot nodes and I is any other node, we can get this from the shortest path trees rooted at nodes A and B. So the cost of computing pairwise distances, AI and IB, is amortized by computing and saving the shortest path trees rooted at A and B. The rest of the algorithm follows the same procedure as before. And in this way, FastMap handled undirected graphs. The final and current step in the evolution of FastMap is to directed graphs, and this brings us to the subject of our work. 
With directed graphs, we have the problem of asymmetric distances between pairs of nodes, i.e. the distance from i to j is not equal to the distance from j to i. So what we do is embed the average distance between nodes in the first k minus 1 dimensions, and then the last or kth coordinate is actually a function over the previous k minus 1 coordinates. This is a potential function, and what we learn is a potential field over the embedding space. This function is learnt such that it accounts for the difference between the directed distance and the average distance embedded. Please note that one limitation in our current approach is that the graph must be strongly connected. That is, there is a path between all pairs of nodes. This is not the same as fully connected, but strongly connected. Let's see an example to help understand our approach. Let's say the distance between nodes i and j was 2 and the distance between j and i was 8. The average distance between them is 5 and this is what we try to embed in the Euclidean space using the first k-1 coordinates. The difference in the last coordinate or the kth coordinate between i and j is what would account for the delta between the average distance and the directed distance. So if we were going from j to i, the difference in the kth coordinate would be 3. And with the average distance of 5 gives us a total distance of 8. In the opposite direction, from i to j, the difference in the kth coordinate would be minus 3, which when added to the average distance gives us 2. And that is how we can account for the asymmetric distances. We embed the average distance and account for the difference with a potential field function. The natural next question is, how do we learn this potential field function? In our work, we represented it as a multivariate polynomial with unknown coefficients, where the variables of this polynomial are defined by the previous k-1 coordinates. We used distances obtained during the embedding process of the prior k-1 dimensions to define constraints on the unknown coefficients. We then solve for these coefficients using linear regression. One can use OLS, Lasso, which is L1 regularized regression, or other regularization variants. We got the best results with Lasso. Please note that the ML module used for learning Psi, the potential field function, is a plug-and-play component. It can be learned with neural networks or any ML module that does regression. In order to test our method, we used benchmark maps from moving.ai and converted the undirected graphs to directed graphs. We did this by assigning a virtual height to each node based on its xy coordinates in the map. This height was used to assign asymmetric edge weights between connected nodes. Combined with the existing graph structure from the maps, we were able to generate strongly connected graphs with asymmetric path distances between nodes. While making our presentation, we fixed an implementation mistake and got better results than those that appear in the paper. We will present the better results here. Our code will be available on GitHub for you to play with under the name of the paper FastMapD. Now let's look at some results. In all experiments, we tested our algorithm on two directed graph versions of each benchmark. The one on the left uses a height function defined by a polynomial function of the map coordinates, and the one on the right uses an exponential function on the coordinates to define the height. Let me reiterate that the heights are then used to assign asymmetric edge weights in opposing directions between every two connected nodes. So an exponential function gives us more asymmetry to the edge weights. Also, in these results, we measure the error via normalized root mean square error. It is the standard deviation of the errors normalized by the average distances of the parts in the graph. This metric helps us compare the results across different graphs. One important point to note in all these results, the potential field function is a second order polynomial function over the first k minus 1 coordinates. So that would be all first and second order terms. These terms would be d1, d1, d2, d1 square, where d1 and d2 are coordinates in different dimensions. 
Now in this map, for the polynomial height function on the left, you can see that FastMap D performs significantly better than the FastMap algorithm, which only embeds the average distance. The last coordinate, when used for the potential field, is much more powerful in representing directed graph distances than using it to represent more of the average distance between nodes. For the exponential height function on the right, we see a similar trend, but the normalized, the normalized root mean square error is not quite as low for the same settings. The more asymmetrical and complex a graph's distances are, the harder it would be to capture these distances. This graph comes from a slice of Boston city map. We see similar trends here, but notice that in the exponential height case, embedding only the average distance results in an error greater than 1.0. This means that the standard deviation of the error is larger than the average path distance in the graph. However, with FastMap D, we are able to bring it down to 0.3. For this maze map, the difference between using just the average distance and FastMap D is not as pronounced, but still appreciable. Finally, in what was the hardest map to capture the distances, this randomized map from the benchmark with an exponential height function required 30 dimensions for FastMap D to bring the nRMSE down to 0.35. In these results, we vary both the number of dimensions and the degree of the potential field function. In the plot on the left, the x-axis is the number of dimensions. The plot on the right is the same data with the degree of the polynomial on the x-axis. As one might expect, the higher the degree of the potential field function, the lower the nRMSE. Now let's take a look at some results with using fully connected neural networks. When we use the raw xy coordinates of the map to represent the input nodes, it's very hard for the neural network to learn the distances between nodes, as illustrated in the second column of this table. The error seldom drops below 1, and if so, only by an insignificant amount. However, if we use the embeddings from FastMap and use the neural network to learn the potential field function, the performance is spectacularly better and much better than using lasso with 15 dimensions and a second order polynomial function. The trade-off is that neural network training takes more time and more training data. For both the neural network settings, we gave all the shortest path tree data for the 15 embedding dimensions from FastMapD with lasso. So we think that if training time is not a concern, and is an upfront cost that can be incurred to learn a better potential field function, then using a neural network could work better. A point that we want to highlight is that these results show the benefit of using a more informative representation as input for an ML module. In this case, it's embedding versus raw coordinate representation. In this paper, we presented a generic framework for representing directed graphs in embedding space, independent of a specific application. In the future, we will look at the performance in specific applications, such as path planning and multi-agent meeting problem, specifically in comparison with differential heuristics as advised by one of our reviewers. As mentioned, this framework is more general and extends to other problems involving graphs, so we would like to investigate its efficacy in search and analysis on, say, social network graphs for detecting communities, clustering, and so forth. Lastly, we would like to relax the requirement of needing strongly connected graphs for our method. In summary, graph embeddings can be used for a variety of AI problems, and FastMap can efficiently embed undirected graphs. FastMap D is an effective generalization for directed graphs by embedding distances within a potential field. What we hoped to get across in this paper is that our embedding method works for different graph configurations and that the asymmetric distances can be captured well. The output of FastMapD is a representation that can then be used by ML modules for downstream tasks like path computations and clustering. 
Thank you for listening to our idea.
Hi, my name is Eli Boyarski. I'm presenting FKDNA conflicts in conflict-based search, a collaboration between Ben Gurion University and Monash University. So, we all know that in conflict-based search, we start from the set of individually optimal shortest paths for all of the agents, and we search for a set of paths that is conflict-free. So, the question is, which conflict should we resolve first? Should we resolve the green conflict, one of the yellow conflicts, or one of the red conflicts? So, we already know it's better to resolve one of the red conflicts first, because they are cardinal, meaning both conflicting agents have no alternative path of the same cost. I'm going to try to convince you that it's best to choose the dark red conflict first. First, notice that this conflict happens after Agent Y has already reached its goal, because Agent Y is planned to reach its goal at time step 5, and Agent Z is planned to pass through Agent Y's goal at time step 6. Now, I need to tell you a bit about heuristics for CBS. The basic heuristic we have for CBS is the size of the minimum relative cover of the cardinal conflict graph. This is the cardinal conflict graph for the same set of agents as before. Each agent that has a cardinal conflict has a vertex, and vertices have an edge between them if they have a cardinal conflict between them. So the size of the minimum vertex cover for this set of agents is 2, because we have to choose either A or B and agent Y. Now, what would happen if we really resolve the conflict between Y and Z? When we replan agent Y, this is the kind of conflict graph that we're going to be left with, because not only is agent Y going to avoid the conflict with agent Z, it's also probably going to be able to avoid the conflict with agent X. When we replan agent Z, this is the cardinal conflict graph that we're going to be left with. The, notice the size of the minimum vertex cover in the right child node stays the same. So, in the left child node, the cost for agent Y increased by 2 because it had to leave its goal and then, and then come back. And the heuristic value decreased by 1. So, in total, the F value increased by 1. In the right child node, the f value increases by 1 because the g value increased by 1 from the path of g, from of z, sorry, and the h value stays the same. So in total, this is what we call an f cardinal conflict. And regular cardinal conflicts we now call g cardinal conflicts. f cardinal conflicts guarantee that the f value of child nodes will increase. We experimented with two versions of CBS. The basic version was a modern implementation of CBS that prioritizes G cardinal conflicts, and our new version was the same implementation that now also prioritizes F cardinal conflicts before G cardinal conflicts. As we can see, on the standard benchmark, for every type of map, more instances were solved by the algorithm that also prioritized F cardinal conflicts. Hard instances were instances that required more than, than half the time, the time limit to solve. And for those hard, hard instances, F, F cardinal conflicts are even more important. As you can see, almost twice the number of agents for every type of map were solved by the algorithm that prioritized F cardinal conflicts. In the future, we plan to use the F value of CBF nodes for other techniques, and we plan to also try to identify F-cardinal conflicts using the look-ahead. Thank you.